Hi everyone, it's Victoria here, and welcome to the podcast. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know about the free courses the Victoria Stowell Academy has available to enroll in right now for dog geeks like you. Just go to vsdogtrainingacademy.com and click the enroll button, and you'll see the free course options. That's vsdogtrainingacademy.com. See you there. Back by popular demand. Uh, we had so many comments after the last podcast I did with you, Joe, because people were just fascinated with your telling of the story of how Twist, your border collie, came into your life and of this scaredy, fearful puppy that you had, that you you inherited, I mean, that just came to you like that, ge- genetically predisposed and your journey with the beautiful Twist. And so I'm so glad you're back on the podcast because We might just touch on that again for people who haven't heard your story with Twist, but it also with the subject that you're talking about at the Dog Behavior Conference, because you are a speaker at the Dog Behavior Conference, this also connects to it. And it's called The Thrill of the Chase, Understanding Why Dogs Chase and What You Can Do About It. And because you have Twist the Border Collie and... Uh, have a lot of experience with Border Collies. You know all about this subject, and that is why you coming to speak at the conference is so exciting. So first of all, welcome to the podcast, Joe. And yes, let's just talk Border Collies and chasing and all kinds of other dogs, and then maybe we'll dish a little dirt on the Dog Academy. (laughs) Who knows? Because for all of those of you in the UK that are listening, you'll have seen Joe Pay on the Dog Academy, the wonderful Joe Pay, and where you were working with Marvin, a border collie there, who was very fearful and actually uh, um, had that ability to bite. Uh, but you are also, uh, you, you just do amazing things. You work miracles. And in this last series that we f- filmed, we don't know when it's coming out. We hope it's this year, but it might be next year you just done some remarkable training. It is remarkable what you have done. So maybe we'll talk about the Dog Academy too without giving too much away because we're really not allowed to talk about the new series, but we we might dish the dirt a tiny bit. Welcome. Thank you. Spo- spoilers. This is what we have to be careful of, isn't it? All these spoilers of the Dog Academy and, and the conference. So yeah, we need to we need to keep cool yeah. and keep yeah, yeah. it on yeah. it. It's great to be back. And thank you so much for another invite. Um, I got some lovely feedback after the last time we, we spoke together. Um, I didn't expect that. And I got some beautiful emails from people who had seen Marvin on the Dog Academy. And then they listened to the podcast and heard about Twist and, and his needs and so many people reaching out to me just to say, really just to thank me for for allowing them to feel validated in their feelings, if you will. Because when you have a fearful dog and you have all these expectations of how wonderful dog ownership is going to be and we're going to do all these lovely things together and that doesn't happen, it's you go through this it's a real process of coming to terms with it and I think to to tell people that it's normal to feel those things and it's okay to not like your dog and it's okay to think that maybe you've made a mistake and and then grieve for the the dog that you thought you were going to get but you never did and then come round to learning and loving your dog and actually maybe loving it more than you did than you thought you could um so for those people, it was really lovely to hear that there are people like me out there who who felt this way, um, but that also hearing what I had to say was useful for them. So brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Where are you with Twist now? Um, so, well, right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's right, right there. <laughs> right now, he's right here with me. But yeah, where we are now, he's... Um, It's really interesting because as a dog trainer, I think that you you watch your dog all the time. 
um, and you look to make progress all of the time. And we're at a point now where I think, as I mentioned last time, I chose not, I've chosen not to medicate Twist. He's 10 years old now. Um, and I can manage him and his, his little world is very, very happy. So we are at a point now where he has his own space to walk in. Um, and he's very, very happy. He's very relaxed there. He, he loves to be there. It never gets boring or, or old for him. He loves it. And I'm really fortunate that I found that. So we walk there every single day. Um, he doesn't come across dogs. Actually, that's a lie. I was going to say he doesn't come across dogs that are not familiar. That's a lie. He's not overwhelmed by any dogs that are not familiar to him, would be more fair to say. He, I keep trying to ask for a little bit more. But what's really interesting to is to take yourself out and observe from kind of up above yourself when you're training your dog. He used to chase traffic. Well, he used to chase everything, and we'll come to that probably later. But then he became fearful of traffic, and he's fearful of lots of things. Um, but what's interesting is we talk about desensitization and counter-conditioning to things that you're afraid of. And we talk about changing emotion. But what's really interesting is I can walk twist along the road outside his little field, his safe space. And he's loosely walking, he's beautiful. And he knows that every vehicle that goes past, he looks at the vehicle, he looks at me, he gets his street. And it, it looks great, looks like it's fixed. But every vehicle that goes past, he, his eyes go. Mm. He doesn't lunge, he doesn't pull, he doesn't spin or bark or cry, he doesn't try and escape. But there's just a little wince and he narrows his eyes and it's like, oh. And then it's gone. And it's so interesting, isn't it, that whose benefit am I doing this for again? Why, why, am, I, why, why am I doing this? Because he's, he knows, he's learned the rule. He's learned the rule. We walk here, I don't pull. Um, I don't, you know, I don't do anything. And I know that if I look at the traffic, she likes that. I'll look at the traffic, I'll look back at her. She'll give me a click, she'll give me a treat. And I know how to do that. And I can do it and I can be successful. Does he feel any better? I don't think he does. And I don't think he ever will. So. But he's we, tolerating it. Yes. He's, he's tolerating coping and, it. To, coping with it to mm, a point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I probably could walk him on the pavement and take him for, you know, a few miles next to road. But does he love it? No. No, he doesn't. Does he? Does it upset him a bit? Yeah. Yeah, it does. He doesn't, it, it's not his favorite thing. So we go to his field and we play hoopers and we play tracking games and we hide things and he hunts for mice, doesn't catch them, he's rubbish. Um, but he hunts for them anyway. Um, there's a, a, a big flood and he loves to paddle. So he goes in there. Um, he has started being around another dog. I've got a lovely friend, Heather, who has Border Collies too. We all kind of, we come together <laughs> in groups, all these Border Collie people. Um, and she has two new Collies. Um, I think Scout is about nine, 10 months old now. And Nico, her baby boy, is about five months old now. And we get together at a weekend at a, a local dog barn. And we each train our dogs and we take it in turns. And, and Twist loves Heather and Heather loves Twist. So we're all good. We can be friends and I can be with a person and not just a dog. Um, and we started doing some work where have, Heather has her little girl in the barn playing. And I get Twist out and we go in a safe, a safe area with a fence between us. And he watches her and, and he sits. And initially we'd get quite a lot of hard eye and stare and his ribs would be going and really puffing. But now he gets out and he's quite soft and big wags. And so would he like a doggy pal? I'm asking him. Um, yeah. With people, people that come to the house and come in and, and allow him to make friends with them. He loves, he, he likes to make new friends. And once you're his friend, he's your best friend ever. So that's where we are. And, oh, we, we, 
we have a holiday booked somewhere safe where he can go. It's got, I think he's got something crazy like nine acres in a river in the middle of nowhere. But so he goes on holiday and it, it's a different lifestyle than I was expecting, but it's, he's worth it. And we're all used to it as a family and it's, it works. So we're good, I would say. I've come into, I mean, I've been to your house many times and we we go through a little bit of a procedure when we come in as in we don't get into his space and he likes just to come and look and if he comes and looks great and if he comes and sniffs great and we give him a toy and then he either chooses to like you or he chooses to actually or not even like you as he chooses to interact or not and that's fine. And I do remember when we were watching television then he did, he came up to me and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> he sat there with me and I was like, okay, we're friends now. That's yeah, good. That's it. But yeah, it's, it's important that, 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 that a dog, a dog like that is not pushed yeah. and, and you're asking him. I love that because so much of the time we're telling our dogs, aren't we? But you're asking him and it, you're having a conversation and I think that's that's why he's successful with you and you have found what works for him. Now, interestingly enough, what you say about his behavior along the road, as in he's he's not entirely happy there. No. But how we can't have our dogs going, yay, at everything and like where is that? I mean, they're not it just that's just not going to happen like humans. Yeah, I love to go can't. up to London, but I, I, and I love riding the train when there's not a lot of people, but I absolutely hate the train when there's a whole load of people. I have to tolerate it. I'm not going to yeah. react to anybody, but I have to tolerate it. It is not a great experience. And don't we go through life like that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We do. And I, we can't, we can't eliminate all stress from everyone's life could we you know we just that's that's not possible so which is why I continue with him to to ask him or it's not something I would do all of the time walking him on pavement for example but we still will sit in the car and watch traffic go by we will still practice walking in along that bit of pavement by the field we will still go sit outside the vets in the car park and get out of the car and have a bit of a sniff around the car park and get back in. We'll do that again with his muzzle on just because there are going to be occasions in his life where he has to deal with that. Now I'm fortunate that I can cushion his life most of the time, but there are going to be occasions where he has to get out of the car and walk from A to B. He just will. There will be occasions where there'll be people who will stare at him that he doesn't cope with very well, but he's going to have to deal with it. There are going to be dogs who are going to stand and stare. It just so I think as much work for him as I can do to keep a paw in, if you will. That yes. He's like, oh, yeah, sometimes this happens to me and actually I'm OK. Then I think I need to do that. Because there is a lot, there's a lot of comfort in predictability, especially for dogs like Twist. And that predictability surprises are not welcome. So yeah. if you can practice potentially what might happen, which is why muzzle training is so important, which is why you're taking the car and going to the car park outside the vets and taking him out and then going back in again, and then he's coming out with a muzzle. So practicing, so it's not just such a shock when it does come and he has to go to the vet. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I'm very fortunate. He's only been, ever been really poorly once. And we're, kind of, we're going off at a tangent about, about vets now. But um, when he was poorly, he was so, so poorly that he didn't care <laughs> about the vet there. But other than that, and that doesn't seem to have left a mark, actually, mm. because after that, subsequent vet visits, um, I muzzle him. My vet, Mahela, always says to me, I don't think he needs to be muzzled. And I'm like, I think you're probably right, but can we just keep the muzzle on anyway? Because I relax more. And as soon as his vaccine is done, which is usually, well, touch wood, all he needs, we take the muzzle off and he plays with my vet and he takes treats from her. He does tricks for her because she's one of his pals. Um, 
But it's important to me that getting to the vet doesn't always mean that the vet's going to come and do something. It, having the muzzle on in that location doesn't always mean that someone's going to come touch you when you'd rather they didn't. So it's just creating that kind of robustness and resilience, but also having that mental bank account is full of positive things happening when all of when this situation comes together. So that the one occasion that he does have to have his temperature taken or, you know, something like that, I can I can afford a withdrawal on that trust account, if you will, because he's like, well, you know what? Mostly this is good. So I'm going to let you get away with it. Yeah. Now the 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 chasing, <laughs> the chasing. You you've become known, very well known, for being very good at this, with all kinds of dogs, not just border collies. No. And when people do have a dog that chases things, obviously the focus is always being put on how to stop a dog from chasing. But can you tell me why that idea is a bit problematic? In that that sort of approach, of course, we don't want the dog to chase. So in a way, we want to stop. But before we even work on trying to stop the dog from chasing, what is your pre-work that you have to do before that? So we need to look at, at primarily for me, we look at breed type. Um, what, what was the dog bred to do? And all of our dogs have some part of that predatory motor sequence, don't they? That has chase in amongst it. Uh, that said, you know, sometimes there's a curveball, which we had a curveball in the Dog Academy, didn't we? Which one was that? With a, with a chase. You had, I can't give spoilers, can I? But you had a, a dog for chase that's not Oh, yes, 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 of course. For chase yes. issues. But yes, I did. What's really interesting with that, I thought, was this particular breed, we're giving just a little tiny hints now, this particular dog breed does not come in the color that that one came in right and i think somewhere in that line we have sprinkled a little bit of something nice and pretty colored that also has yes some predisposition to chase. yes i i absolutely agree with you so a hundred percent yeah yeah it was extraordinary looking dog mm. very quite rare but yes. So, okay. So we look at the breed type. We look at the breed type um, to see what are the re what are the needs because chase is not wrong. If you're a dog, it's it's not a problem. It's definitely not a problem if you're a dog. It's a great thing, but it's not wrong either. For from the point of view as an owner, they're not wrong to chase things. It's not a bad thing. It's not a naughty thing. So what we need to look at is kind of um, like lots of branches of a tree all coming together when we look at Chase. We need to look at what is the motivation? What does that dog need? What are they looking for? What are they seeking when they are chasing? Then we need to look at how can, maybe not necessarily in this order, but how can we, how can we feed that need in a more appropriate way to give the dog the outlet because if we give the dog the outlet, the first, uh, very often, a lot of it goes in inappropriate places. The behavior starts to lessen anyway, just by having your fix. Again, oh, I'm contradicting myself now. That said, sometimes if the outlet is not quite right, what we actually get is, is more desire to chase. More desire, yes. More desire to get that hit. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's giving outlet that's appropriate. It's understanding motivation. It's understanding your breed type. It's, a, I'm trying to think how the best, best way to say this without kind of just <laughs> going into massive detail. <laughs> it's allowing the dog to be exposed to those things in such a way that it doesn't really feel like chasing right now. Because when they're in that part of learning, in that part of the central nervous system, they're receptive to input and they can learn. Just that little thing's just here in the corner, but actually I'm receptive and I can hear you and I can learn. So it's so much about management, 
understanding your dog, understanding motivation, um, understanding learning theory. What's better? What, what can I give my dog as a reward that will make my dog want to do what I want instead of that, that chase over there? So it's, I think that chase is extremely complicated, extremely complicated. And what I see time and time and time again is people trying to distract their dog from the thing that it wants to chase. And it just doesn't work. No. It just doesn't. You can't. You cannot. If I was trying to distract a really well-bred working sheepdog from sheep, you, I should not be able to. I should not. Like even the smell of sheep poop should not be a good enough distraction for a working sheepdog. Otherwise, they'd be rubbish, wouldn't they? They would. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's it's really complicated. And if you go in with a light touch of, oh, I'm just going to teach it, um, or watch me. Watch me is great and useful in this arena, but you can't go in and say, hey, don't look at that, look at me. No, because you cannot. That on its own, it's just not going to work. So it's so complex. I don't know where I've answered your question. Yeah, no, you have <laughs> answered my question. The, the activity level of chasing, that adrenaline that goes through that body, if you're trying to match it with something else that causes that adrenaline to rush through the body, sometimes, yes, uh, sitting and watching you and not watching that thing that you really want to go and chase, I, I think it's counterproductive. But have you seen when you try and match energy level with something similar? So let's say, I don't know, you're your dog wants to chase something and yet, no, you can't do that, but you can chase this little fluffy thing here. Mm. I mean, I can see that sometimes for some dogs that would be like, yeah, I can't go there, but I can go here. But then I've also seen in some other dogs, um, okay, this is like now freaking me out. Now my adrenaline has gone from really high to like really, really high. Yeah. You're doing this activity here. I am going to do this activity, but oh my God, I still want that. Yes. Yes. Really common. And I think, um, I think that mistake gets made early doors training. I think when you first start, the training needs to evolve. So when I work with a traffic chasing or a um, livestock chasing or wildlife chasing dog, we can start to substitute don't chase that, chase this instead. But you can't rush to that point because the dog's arousal level in a chasey situation where they can smell wildlife or they can hear sheep perhaps, their arousal level is so high when you first start because they have often such, um, such a great reinforcement history from being able to practice chasing that the urge to seek that dopamine hit is huge and it's like gambling. It's, it's, it's that addictive quality. You can't just go straight in with, Hey, here's a toy, chase this instead. You know, that smells like the wrapping that you got it from in the shop and it doesn't really move like a rabbit. I don't care. Um, so early doors, the mistake I see made with don't chase that, that chase this is usually it, you've tried it too soon. Mm. But here's the thing. If you try that too soon, you've probably poisoned it for later as well. Yeah. You can't go then use it because they're like, oh, I see what you're doing. You've got that pretend rabbit out of your hat. Okay. I know there's something here I could chase then. So the order of things and looking at the arousal level and recognizing body language, just because I'm not moving doesn't mean I'm not chasing in my head. It, the, it's so complicated. So this for that is good, but this for that has to be done later. Yeah. When I can think about that instead of this. Otherwise, you are really setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. You are. Yeah. And you're setting, and more, I mean, you're setting your dog up for failure. And well, and then subsequently yourself, because mm. then you know, we can never be off lead or we can never walk in that area. Um, and there's a lot of, I think in all aspects of dog training, not just chase, there's a lot of rushing to a solution and tricking dogs. 
And you can trick them once or twice and they're very obliging, but you're not going to trick them more than that. And I, I think I see that most frequently with recall, which we, we touched on briefly before we started um, on the podcast. But I see that most frequently in, in recall training. You know, the what's this? How many people say, what's this? Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And the dog, the first two times will go, oh, what is this? I'm going to come and have a look what it is. Third time, they're like, yeah, I know what it is. It's you and you're tricking me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not coming. Bye. So I think that you've, you've got to be really careful not to rush to a solution and not to trick. Which is very hard, especially when you're working on a television show. And you've got only like three hours to deal with a really complex behavior. I want to talk about that after we come back from this short break. A quick break here to get a word from this episode's sponsor, the Victoria Stillwell Academy. Now, did you know that I have a school that teaches people to be dog trainers? I love It's Me or the Dog and my work as a dog trainer on television, but... Those of you who know me know that my true passion really lies with helping other people live their best lives with dogs. And I love seeing that truly magical transformation when that light bulb goes off with someone I'm helping with their dog. That's what it's all about. It's the secret source that pet professionals like me, who work with these amazing animals, that's what we all share. It's what makes being a dog trainer the most rewarding, enriching job I can imagine. It's why I love what I do. And it's also why I founded the Victoria Stillwell Academy, so that I could provide a roadmap to others who want to help dogs and the people who love them learn to do what they love doing at the highest level, that is to become professional dog trainers. Earning a living working with dogs professionally has been a dream of mine for years. And that passion is what drives all of us at VSA to create courses that are specially designed to help adult human learners chase their dreams. Now, most people already know about our flagship dog trainer course, which provides both online only and in-person options. But did you know that we also offer both dog guardians and future professionals a fully refundable 10 hour online course taught by me another awesome VSA faculty, and it's called the Fundamentals of Dog Training and Behavior course. Now, I know it's not the sexiest name, but it's one of the most dynamic learning experiences available to dog geeks, and it's a pretty awesome first step to see if learning with VSA is right for you. Now, as a Positively Podcast listener, you can use promo code PODCAST right now to get the Fundamentals course for 50% off. That is a hundred and fifty dollar value so take our course plus we also have a couple of free starter courses they're free completely free including a course called building your dog's confidence which reveals the secret ingredient to a happy dog life so i encourage you to check out vsa today as i said we have courses for all levels of learners so it doesn't matter whether you're a newbie with your first puppy or a, or a grizzled vet already making a living as a pet professional. Visit Positively.com slash VSA to learn more and enroll in a free course. That is Positively.com slash VSA. We all want the best for our dogs. Whether that means you taking home some key tips for your own dogs or adding the ultimate in professional dog trainer education. Visit Positively.com slash VSA today. VSA, it is the future of dog training. And now, back to the podcast. All right, I'm back with Joe Pay. We're talking about chasing in dogs. But when, I love this. I love it tricking dogs, right? Because we do a lot of that. All You're, the time. A lot of, and certainly trainers that just start out you know, they rely on sort of trickery, as it were. Uh, and you're talking about an example about re of recall and how, you know, hey, what's this? What have I got? Ooh, and then the dog gets wise to it and goes, yeah, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. No. And, that and that can come with uh, beginner trainers, but also for trainers that are like, oh, I don't have enough time and I need to, I need to show my client a result mm -hmm. right now. And then let's just talk about what it's like to film because, well, you were thrown in the deep end 
last year when you joined the Dog Academy and you were uh, have done amazing stuff on there. But it, television is very, very tough when it comes to, especially if somebody throws this very complex behavior at you and like, mm -hmm. oh, Joe, okay, we want to film this. Go. <laughs> and you're like, uh, yeah. That's why, of course, we plan for so long. But yeah, um, we do. Jeez. It, it, <laughs> can we? Can we train quickly? Because here's the thing. When we're talking about chasing, there, there's a lot of discussion. Sometimes it's not very nice discussion amongst the training community, shall we say, about different methodology. And there's a big thing about dogs chasing livestock yeah. and really the only way, and it's cited many times, the only way you can stop a dog, truly stop a dog from chasing sheep or traffic or anything is with a shock collar. And in fact, it is going to save your dog's life. And you positive trainers, fine, you know, you can use your trickery, <laughs> your bribery. And I just saw something today was like, don't use food, it's bribery. I'm like, oh my God. But you can use that and everything. But what we do saves lives and what you do fails. Yeah. Let's talk about this whole chasing thing with shock and like, why is that so seductive? Why is that message out there? I, I just, you, I, I just put you in that. I'm sorry. I just, I didn't I tell you I was going to talk about that. But. <laughs> but no, but you're right. And why it's out there, I, I don't. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think it's out there because actually having the understanding and the skill to do it without shock is rare 100 percent which 100 i'm well aware that percent. i've just stuck my head above the parrot and i've no doubt people will come to try and shoot me down for that but no 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 but you I have, are I, right both of my colleagues chased both of them did and they um indy used to chase um he he started with little things like push bikes and he graduated to trains okay so that was freaking scary um, and he chased trains when I was out with my children who were tiny at the time. Mm. Um, Twist chased everything from hair he would have chased. Um, he actually did chase sheep. Okay. Confessions of a dog trainer. I was very lucky in that um, my landlady at the place where we do VSA yep. um, had a solar farm. And she was like, you know, do you want to walk in there with your dogs? It's nice and peaceful and quiet. It was massive. And I was like, oh, yeah, great. She was, there's some sheep in there, so just beware. So I was like, okay, it's fine. So I kept my dogs on a lead just because sheep, you know, and that's legally what we're asked to do. And um, I dropped my lead. <laughs> and my little... Thinking, la, 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 this is such a lovely place. Yeah, it's, a a lovely it's, like, it's such a great walk. My dogs Miles are doing great. Away. And I... I it just came out of my hand and it's on the floor and, and twist ran after. She oh, so you just, you didn't, you didn't make a decision to do it. You just dropped oh, no. that leash as in, as it was. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. And the panic and the, the words, you know me, I don't really swear at all, but the no. words that came out that day were choice. And I mean, it was beautiful to watch actually, because he, he chased a little packet of sheep, six of them. And he, he pushed them and they joined onto another little packet of about four. And then he steered them into the corner and he actually never touched them. He lay down about five meters away and kept them in the corner. And he only weighs about 13 kilos. He's wow. He's never been taught to do it. So instincts is cool, isn't it? But so he has chased sheep. And I was very lucky. My landlady saw him and she was like, I figured you'd get him under control at some point. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, so he has chased sheep so he knows how that feels he chased hair he was so fast as a three-year-old dog he could herd hair and bring them back towards me he could get around them he chased hair towards the motorway <sighs> and when it went through the stock fencing um i heard a lady shouting a very attractive jogger wearing fluorescent pink he was chasing her back from the motorway <laughs> oh my god yeah he chased um he chased bikes um so yeah he's Pretty, uh, other, other dogs, 
um, joggers at least twice, which makes me sound really irresponsible, doesn't it? This all happened in a really short space of time and often accidentally. The hair in the motorway was, I was sat in the grass looking at uh, around me and it was all beautiful. There was nobody about. And we sat for about 10 minutes and then stood up, me and Deanne Twist, and a hair flushed as we stood up and he, and he was gone. Um, so he now chases nothing, nothing at all. Um, and admittedly, yes, I'm now in, in a field with him that's my own, but I've only been using that field for less than a year. So up to now, he has walked where there are people, where there are dogs, where there is livestock, where there is wildlife. And he will auto stop and L-A-Y-D-O-W-N. I can't say it because it's here. <laughs> um, he will automatically do that in response to any fast movement. And I have yeah. never used shock or, or anything punishing on him at all because he, I can't. And he's not the only one. So I have a long list of client dogs who now can be free and off lead and have amazing recall around any moving distraction or can walk near traffic. So it's just not necessary. And I think if, if you take the time, you understand the motivation, you understand the training and you have a client who is receptive and you have a lovely relationship with, and that relationship's really, really important. You can't say, oh, this is a good client this is not a good client because they do or they don't listen. It's about your relationship with the client. They have got to believe you. They've got to be invested in you. They've got to trust you. And that comes from the way that you behave when you have interaction with them, how you communicate with them, how open and honest. Um, I think Kay at um, the Dog Academy asked me something about dogs. How do, you, how do, how do, how do dogs trust you? I think is one of the things because we mm -hmm. have to establish such a fast relationship we do. when we're filming with them, don't we? And I said to her, I think the thing is, you just need to be an open book. You can't hide from a dog. You need to be open and honest and receptive. And I believe that goes just the same for your human clients. If you go in and you are completely open book and you are honest and receptive and you hear what their needs are and you hear what they what they're afraid of, then that client is going to be invested in you. And together, you can solve it. But you can't do it in a hurry and you can't do it with any ego attached to you. Now, the, I think the, the seduction of the shock collar is that it, um, well, they say it happens almost immediately, right? Because the animal feels a real pain and uh, or a discomfort, pain, um, truly a shock. Oh, my God, what's that? Yeah. And so it's a corrective instrument that scares the dog into not chasing. But there's also a big discussion, which, I mean, has such fallout and, and, and is, is dreadful for, so, for, for the dog in so many ways, it, it probably much more positively reinforcing for the human and, mm -hmm. and the sheep are happy. But um, there's also this whole idea of berating people who decide not to use shock, but also at the same time are like, while I, tr while I train, while I decide to go down a path where I work up to it so that I get a, a dog that's like twist, um, that is very responsive to me and doesn't chase anymore. I, I'm going to put my dog on the lead. Yeah. And, and if, whether that's just a regular six foot or a 15 foot lead, um, not an extendable, but a 15 foot lead or, or sometimes even longer so that I still have control over my dog around livestock. I, I tend to, I think that's actually showing mass respect. It's showing yeah. respect, not just for the landowner, the farmer whose sheep that they are or who ca whose cows they are. It's showing respect for the livestock. It's also showing respect to, uh, to your dog Absolutely. as well. Because I you're not understand. putting your dog, you're not setting your dog up for failure. And so no. I have to, I have really have to bite back at that. That whole idea that it's actually a failure that you're, well, there you go. You can't train your dog because you're telling 
people to put their dogs on the lead around livestock. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because that is the smart and sensible thing to do. Yeah. And like you said, it's the respectful and responsible thing to do. And I, I, I don't understand that arg- argument. For me, it just does not make any sense. It, the, having your dog on a lead in a situation where it is a danger to anybody else or itself. I don't understand how that is in any way a negative thing. I just, so do you know what? I, I just discount that. Yeah. It's like, do you know what? I just, this is a pointless conversation. Right. And it's exhausting. It is exhausting because you see that. And then of course, but, but the only thing that you can really do to combat it, because it's there, it's there. And it's Mm -hmm. like this annoying mosquito, right? That you're trying to sleep at night and it's around your head. You're like, you're trying to bat it away. The, the, the way you combat is just, just to do it. You teach it how you teach it yourself and advocate for dogs that's all we can that's do. That's what you can do. All we can do is keep training the way that we are training and proving that our methods work. Yeah. That's all we can do. Which, of course, on the Dog Academy, we are showing very quickly, we are setting dogs and people on the path to success. Some yes. behaviors, I mean, we can knock out the park in an hour. <laughs> we can, yeah. as it were, change behavior, but we can create different opportunities for the dog and people within an hour right and so and everybody goes oh my god that's an absolute miracle it's it's it comes from a lot of experience it's not a miracle it's from experience but it's pretty cool when you understand how dogs learn and you can affect change and you can promote confidence and you can build resilience and very fast um but at the same time also uh, some of our cases at the dog academy they they require a launch pad. That's what I call it. And sometimes all we can do is we put the foundations in. That is your foundation from which now you work. Yes, 100%. Um, and that's looking back at Chase, for example, if a customer asks me how long is this going to take, I will say to them, this is going to take six to nine months of work because in the early training sessions, all you can do is start to lay a foundation. You can't rush it. So you need that launch pad to start to make changes. A lot of the launch pad, I think is environmental management. Yes. Because then you start to set up your dog and your family for success. And then training the funky, cool, sexy stuff comes in into play as well. But dogs are, but I think one of the things that surprised me with filming is the first thing is how quickly we honed our skills and how quickly we adapted as trainers and learned that, right, I've got this much time. There's no messing about. Nope. (laughs) You're like, okay, to the point. I'm going to try this. No, not working. Next thing. Not working. Next thing. And you need a good plan. But what amazed me was how resilient the dogs were and how well they coped with what we were asking. Yes. Very, they were incredible, weren't they? Yeah. We Unbelievable. Just <laughs> unbelievable. And in that environment, eager to learn. Yeah. It, sometimes yeah. it was hard for them to begin with. Where am I? And this is just, this is sort of, this is insane, but that we create an environment to set them up for success. Mm. And it truly is amazing to see how these dogs just, okay, and then they start drinking it in. So flexible, so flexible and adaptable. The number of times we looked at each other and were like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And at the end of the day, we'd be like, how did you get on? You're like, they did it. They did it. They did it. <laughs> <laughs> I have one because we, of course, we film more than we sh- we can show. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, eight episodes and I think we're doing three stories an episode. So, yes. but we definitely film more stories than, um, than we actually show. And one of the stories that I, that I don't know whether it's going to be on or not yet, but, um, is one of those stories with a very intense behavior with a German shepherd. And mm. 
um it it truly the change is just remarkable remarkable but you're gonna have to watch and if it's not included then i will talk about it after the episode (laughs) is and and i will say give me some footage please so that i can show people have you spoken to the family since yes i have yeah yeah isn't that the best thing yeah it is the best thing and and they're doing really well and and she's doing really well too so she i'd I'd have taken that dog there are some dogs that you go yeah i'll take you yeah if i lived in the car yeah you're coming home with me (laughs) so many so many but i think that's um what is really difficult to show a lot of people have asked um can't you do something that shows passage of time and it's you just it's so difficult to do that yeah but what i think people haven't realized is that we keep in touch with our clients from the dog academy um for a long time a long time we support them with training and we see the plan to fruition we do. And they keep in touch with us afterwards. Um, I got a message from Jill and John with Maya, the windscreen wiper dog. Yeah. Um, I got a message from her two days ago. Aww. So, And we keep in touch. So what's lovely is although you only see a snippet on the TV show of what we do when we spend such a long time, um, is that it, that's not the end for these people. When they mm. leave, it's not the end. And they get a huge amount of support afterwards so that we they make do. sure that their dog gets what they need. And that's, and that's not seen. I was talking with Kamal the other day and we were like, when we're talking about production companies that, you know, are so kind of giving five mile films is probably the most amazing production company I've ever worked with because talk about truly listening and understanding and giving and really wanting yeah they've got to make a tv show but really wanting success for dogs and 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 their client i mean and their families it's just it's stunning well joe i love speaking with you i cannot wait for your presentation you have got to come and hear joe speak register now for the dog behavior conference april 19th to the 21st Oh my gosh, we have 12 incredible speakers. We have, and I'm going to tell you now, Movement Matters, Movement as a Foundation for All Behaviors, Sarah Fisher. We have Recall, Lisa and Bradner Wagner, Lisa and Bradner Wagner, Lisa and Brad Wagner. We've got, of course, Michael Shikashio coming back with Hostility in the Home, Dog Aggression Directed at Family or Visitors. Then you've got me doing Brave Case Studies using brave strategies to help every dog navigate a challenging world. We've got stuff about choice, the thrill of the chase with you, scent and emotions, emotional well-being, pain and behavior, taking your, I mean, oh my goodness, enrichment, we've got it covered. So come register now, dogbehaviorconference.com. Do not miss out. It's going to be an amazing three days. And if you can't attend live all three days, I don't, I mean, I don't think I could because it's, eight hours per day of amazing information. But don't worry if you miss out because then you have, after you've registered and the presentations go out live, you have access to all of them for a year afterwards. So all the presentations and the Q&As for a year after. So, hey, this is, it's a, it's a great deal. And then you're going to be, you're going to hear some fabulous tips if you have a chaser from the wonderful Joe Pay. Joe, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the invite. We need to do it again. We've got so many other things to talk about. Oh, and you will. I'm going to get you back again, 100%. Well, thanks everyone for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and I will see you another time. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Victoria Stillwell's Positively Podcast. For Victoria's online dog training courses, more information and helpful dog training tips, visit Victoria's official website at Positively.com. Get connected on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media as Victoria Stillwell, and follow her on Twitter at Victoria S. Learn to become a professional dog trainer with the Victoria Stillwell Academy at vsdogtrainingacademy.com. And be sure to tune in next time as Victoria helps you and your dog live your best life together, Positively. Positively.